uh, Paolo, first of all, um, I would like to um, welcome everyone to the regular Vaccelerate webinars. And it's actually a great pleasure and honor to have uh, with us Professor Paolo Palma, who is actually leading the Clinic of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Pediatric Hospital Babino Gesù uh, in Rome, Italy. And today we will have uh, the great pleasure to present us some results uh, from his work and his team uh, related actually with uh, innovative methods identifying uh, genomic profiles of non-responders in vaccination. And this is a very important topic. We would like to sincerely thank you, Paolo. Uh, and the floor is yours to uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you to all the, all the Vaccelerate uh, group uh, for this nice opportunity to, um, to provide you some update regarding uh, the, the activity that we are conducting here in Rome. Um, I'm going to start you with my conflict of interest. Of course, is a, I'm a, one of the founders of this uh, spin-off that is called Probiomics. It's a university of spin-off in the field of omics technology. I would like to provide you a short update uh, regarding, uh, uh, let's say, my institution. I'm, I'm one of the professor of the chair of pediatrics at the University of Rome. But actually, I'm currently working at Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital, which is an academic hospital, research hospital, which is a unique hospital since it's acting within the property of the Holy Site and operates in the Italian national health systems. We do have a number of sites within Rome. And actually, at the moment, it's the largest European uh, pediatric hospital. So here with my team that is here represented that I want to thank with the care of uh, a number of, uh, um, of issue in, 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 in try to, let's say, help and support uh, children affected by primary and secondary immune deficiency. And, um, and of course, we also take care of uh, vaccine aspect of this patient population with special vaccination needs. Uh, this is just to provide you, let's say, some numbers uh, regarding uh, the, 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 um, the epidemiology of the type of patients that we are currently following here. And uh, as you might know, the, the, also according to, to WHO estimates, the, um, the chronic condition actually are really shaping the world population and actually immunization programs need needs uh, actually to, to 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 get along actually somehow and also to 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 uh, consider the fact that uh, these numbers actually will increase uh, even more in the next year this is just uh, uh, let's say a recent update providing you the fact that uh, um, in these patients i'm talking about uh, vulnerable groups so those kids that are, are under treatment with uh, uh, immunomodulants uh, or that uh, are affected by immune defects uh, itself, they do have a higher incidence of vaccine preventable disease. And these are the numbers actually just in 2022, without considering actually COVID-19, we actually uh, can, uh, let's say, register more than 20 thousand cases of vaccine preventable disease. These, of course, vaccine preventable disease, they present higher mobility, uh, higher mortality in this type of population, and we need to do something in order to reduce this number. So a um, few years ago, actually, I started to work with the idea that um, uh, that actually um, current correlates of protection, they do not really, uh, they are not really informative to, to provide us the evidences of uh, those patients that are actually really um, protected or uh, in comparison to those that are not protected actually. So we try to, to think about actually uh, a new methodology in order to evaluate more uh, qualitative the, the immune system of these patients. In other words, to find actually new correlates of protection. In other words, to have more 
actually information and, and more, uh, let's say, tools to really uh, screen and uh, identify those patients that are not protected despite the vaccination. And certainly two major scientific breakthroughs actually occur over this time. One is represented by the, 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 the human and vivo challenge model here on the left, actually, which is depicted here. And the other one is represented by the application of system biology protocols, where nowadays we can really dissect the different layers of complexity of a vaccine-induced immune response, so starting from, from the, the, the cell level into the, let's say, into the um, more in, in details on what happened inside the cells. And this actually is very helpful in order to understand those factors that influence vaccine effectiveness, that there are many, as we discussed many times, and are even more in these populations, actually. Um, well, actually, I think one of the, the, the beauty of the really of the, the this new technology. And now I'm talking about the human in vivo challenge model. I want to discuss you this recent paper that actually came out showing uh, somehow how is, how is possible with these uh, uh, new systems to understand uh, a different level, actually to trace the infection and to understand the correlates of immunity. And this is actually, this is a very interesting paper which just came out showing that uh, activated and proliferating CD8 uh, as, as well as early mucosa IgM and IgA responses uh, correlates with viral load in, in, a, in, uh, in a, a human in vivo challenge model. These patients were uh, let's say, challenge with this uh, pre-alpha SARS-CoV-2 strain, uh, uh, and these were seronegative adults. In other words, by this technology, it's really possible to trace, actually, the, 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 um, the, the infection also in terms of immu immunity. I try to understand, actually, more in details, which are the, the reason why some people get infected and some others do not. But unfortunately, actually, these uh, type of models are not, uh, let's say, applicable in, in this vulnerable population. And for this reason, actually, we are also working in the direction of, uh, instead of, uh, let's say, um, replicating uh, the, 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 um, the on, to evaluate in vitro the human, uh, um, the immune response of patients affected by uh, by any type of disorders. And in this recent review here, we really revised the pro and cons of, uh, all, of all the available actually technology. And um, uh, we are working in several directions. One of our system is based on, and we will see uh, this later on the in vitro stimulation of PBNC from these patients. So, uh, in order to evaluate those genomic signatures that actually can predict at baseline uh, responsiveness to vaccine. But there are a number of different, uh, let's say, in vitro testing that can mimic uh, somehow the 3D system. So uh, mimic the interaction in a 3D system of the cells. Uh, and uh, this is something that we are doing in collaboration with Ufer Levy at uh, Harvard University in order to to, let's say, try to um, create a, a human uh, tissue construct, uh, which is able really to replicate those features uh, that are present also in vulnerable population. So one of my view is that by the comparison of these in vivo in vitro systems in the same individual, we do expect to gain major information in the next future. This is something that actually we apply for and, and uh, we think this is type of technology can really represent a breakthrough if we can actually collect from the same individuals information at the same time points and, and really try to, to disseminate this information actually and translate this information into the design of new vaccine, uh, in, into the design of new vaccine. At the same time, actually one other aspect that I want to, to alight you uh, is coming from this um, very recent paper that has been published in Science Translation of Medicine, in which actually they start to, to face uh, actually uh, and to, uh, to, um, to describe, which is actually the kinetics of SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA in, in, in different groups of immunocompromised patients. 
as you can see here, actually STH are those patients that are actually transplanted patients. And then actually they have a group of, of uh, severe autoimmune patients and uh, and then and they compare this with non-severe uh, immune defect patients. So in other words, here you can see clearly that according to the type of immune defects, the infection has different actually uh, um, viral shedding. As you can see here, these are the 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 red ones. You see that the transplanted patients have a much longer viral shedding. Why this is important? This is important because actually this is very much linked, and I will show you we with a higher rate of a viral um, a viral resistance strains. Um, first of all, this is the formation and the reason why you observe such a uh, huge diversity is very much linked to the fact that uh, the spike protein specific T cells actually in these patients evaluated through helispots actually are um, incredibly different according to the, the, the condition or according to the patient group. In other words, transplanted patients, they do not develop a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 specific responses, which is not the case of severe autoimmune ones or, or the other group of patients evaluated. So T cell responses, again, is crucial and, uh, and is one of the uh, factors that need to be carefully evaluated in different conditions, also as a correlate of protection. And this is the information that I was, I was uh, telling you about. This is reported the increased SARS-CoV-2 evolution and the genetic diversity in, in these immunocompromised patients. And this is very important because this actually mutation confers an increased risk of also of resistance to anti-SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody therapies. And again, what this is a crucial factor because uh, as was your experience, uh, I guess uh, that's also, that was also my experience. Uh, these patients are the patients that we really want to protect and, and, and these are the patients that we treat with monoclonal antibody ter therapies. So it's carefully important to deeply evaluate these patients and this actually, um, this huge diversity that is different among the groups uh, has a, 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 a potential impact also in terms of uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So transmission of variant of concern, uh, which are related to the fact that you also have an increase in viral shedding, as you can see here, as well as uh, actually um, a potential increase of uh, contagious windows. In our hospital, we had uh, some experience in evaluating uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in different group of patients. Uh, we evaluated patients affected by primary immune defects as well as um, patients affected by HIV, by Down syndrome, as well as uh, transplanted patients and patients affected by uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And these are the reference reported here. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it is summarized, but I will go deeply into the details. Uh, the vaccine worked quite well uh, in all these patients, but uh, actually we observe a reduction in cellular response in some group of these patients. In order to characterize uh, all these groups, uh, as uh, I anticipate to you, we develop in my lab um, uh, system biology, a number of system biology protocols that actually allow us not only to evaluate it, to characterize uh, the immunophenotype of the cells, so try to understand which cells are involved upon a vaccine uh, stimulation, but also to evaluate uh, transcriptomic profiles, the methylation profile of this patient, as well as uh, which type of, of cytokines are produced by, by the cells uh, upon a vaccination challenge. And I need to thank again a number of people, the, all the people in the labs actually that are working with me. And many of course of the data that I'm going to show you are produced thanks to this collaboration and also thanks to the, the work of, uh, of administrative personnel and the work of the research nurses team. So a first information that I want to share with you uh, is the fact that uh, once that you vaccinate uh, an, an immunosuppressive, uh, 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 patients under immunosuppressive treatment is critically important to, un to consider 
the immunosuppressive regimen. Not all the, the drugs are the same. Not all the drugs have the same, uh, let's say, impact in terms of, uh, of vaccination outcome. So in this uh, study here, we had the opportunity to evaluate uh, um, cellular and antibody response in transplanted patients. And actually, you can see here that uh, those patients that actually are undertreated with mycophenolate, uh, they do not actually respond properly, almost all of them, upon SARS-CoV-2 uh, Pfizer vaccine, uh, and do not, do not display a cellular immune response. So this is something which is important and is not only is not only present in, in transplanted patients but also in patients uh, under treatment with uh, biological such as patients affected by inflammatory bowel disorders where again as you can see here patients that were under treatment with the uh, anti tnf alpha such as infliximab actually they they do not respond properly uh, over time uh, uh, in comparison to all the other patients, uh, I'm talking again in comparison to patients uh, uh, affected by inflammatory basal disease, uh, but not under treatment with the same therapy. So what we can do in order to, let's say, better evaluate uh, immune response in these patients, uh, and uh, which are the strategy to identify possible biomarkers of vaccine responses, uh, what I try to do here is to summarize a strategy which is uh, mostly based on the primary immune responses or another strategy which is based on the secondary immune response. So uh, the, first, the first strategy that I want to evaluate with you is based on the, on the idea that it's possible to, let's say, evaluate the patients before I perform uh, 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 the vaccination in order to understand if those patients they have some some uh, particular features that are linked or, collect or connected with, uh, I would say, with the lower vaccine responsiveness. So one of the things that we do actually is we evaluate plasma proteomics before the vaccination. And this is quite important. These are the results performed on, 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 on the group of HIV patients that we are following here in Rome. And as you can see here, actually, HIV patients, they do have much higher basal inflammation, which is present before actually the vaccination and baseline inflammation proteins actually, uh, they distinguish the magnitude of vaccine induced in, uh, immune response. In other words, those HIV patients with higher inflammation than baseline actually are the, the patients that the, the response uh, worse in comparison to the those patients that instead they have a lower inflammation. Also, the baseline is possible to work actually on the possibility to evaluate uh, what happens in terms of uh, uh, cellular immune response. This is mostly due to the idea that we can characterize through flow cytometry actually the, the phenotype of these patients. And according to the phenotype, try to clusterize actually, and try to, let's say, predict the outcome of the vaccinations. So a particular actually subset of interest in our idea is the fact that the B cell compartment can provide us a number of information. And um, overall, actually, we focalize our attention on a typical B cell compartment that we recently revised in this review on journal Holiday Clean Immunology, in which actually you can see that, uh, uh, let's say, of course, B-cell substance change uh, with age, this is quite clear, but you can see that there are some atypical B-cells that actually are present even in, in, in kids, but they can be expanded in a number of situations. Why these cells are important actually? These cells are important because they actually, they do not actually uh, represent, uh, let's say a, a functional memory. Uh, they're not in favor of functional memory response. Uh, if they are expanded over a certain frequency that still need to be clearly identified. But these cells are, are characterized uh, here by the downregulation of CD21, as well as by the downregulation of uh, CD27, IgD, whereas actually they do overexpress Tibet and the integrin CD111. So as I was telling you, there are some particular features since our immune system is dynamic and change over time according to the challenges that actually we face uh, over life. 
there, during acute infection, these cells actually, they're even functional, so they rapidly expand after the vaccination, but then they return to, uh, to normal level. Uh, when do you find actually when do you find actually an expansion of these cells? We will see in a while that uh, what does it mean. Uh, what I can tell you that there are, there are a number of chronic conditions, chronic infections such as malaria infection or HIV or hepatitis C, where these B cell subjects are abnormally expanded, as well as uh, also you, there are a number of immune system disorders such as uh, autoimmune disorders or uh, or. Uh, Common variable immune deficiency, or um, again in in in, in um, multiple sclerosis, where these B cell subjects are abnormally expanded. Uh, here in hospital, we had really had the opportunity to evaluate uh, the frequency of the cells in at the time of the vaccination in response to a number of vaccines. And as you can see here, for instance, uh, in HIV patients. Uh, a uh, high level of these cells are actually were uh, strictly linked with a, a reduced ability to mount uh, a, a protective response against uh, influenza. And as well as actually, we also observe uh, an, uh, an expansion of these uh, uh, B cells uh, subset uh, uh, upon vaccination for MMB. And then more recently, actually, we had the opportunity to publish this data from in collaboration with the University of Miami, where actually we, we evaluate a group of HIV infected patients in comparison to HIV exposed and infected patients. As you can see here, we describe a certain rate of unprotected patients according to antibodies here. Um, so this means that uh, actually, unfortunately, the, the local schedules doesn't actually warrant protection against tetanus and against measles in, in, these, uh, in these individuals. And when we try to interrogate actually uh, for a machine learning approach, actually, um, the reason for that, again, B cell phenotype is among the most informative features uh, linked with the lower ability of these people to to mount of these children, sorry, uh, to mount a, a vaccine specific immune response. So baseline sample actually again, so expansion of atypical B cells at the time of vaccination in these patients uh, actually was strictly linked with the lower immune responses. Again, another evidence coming from our data in transplanted patients, where actually we had the opportunity to show that. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of people that were not protected against measles vaccines. And this was shown by, uh, by ELISA, but also we lo look at uh, avidity of antibodies and also we look at specific B cells uh, uh, through, through B cells fluorospot for measles. And you can see here there are again a strict uh, correlation between the expansion of these cells. Uh, uh, double negative and uh, tissue like memory B cells and activated B cells, which are not actually strictly, which are again strictly linked with, with a reduced uh, ability to mount uh, a specific immune response. Another evidence coming from a, a primary immune defect, which is a which is actually chronic granulomatosis disease, which is a primary defect where you cannot actually really clear the antigen because you have a, def a, a deficiency in the in the um, in the um, in the ROS pathway, and so uh, you cannot really actually fully destroy the antigen. So the neutrophils do not properly work. They phagocyte the antigens, but they are not able to destroy it. And this is actually responsible for a chronic immune activation. Again, this chronic immune activation is, is related with uh, a reduced, uh, for instance, uh, um, protection again against. Uh, um, measles, which is again uh, confirmed by flow cytometry at the time of vaccination, but also by HeliSpot. So this is something that we can do to characterize our patient at the time of vaccination. At the same time, we can also, and this is quite interesting for us, also try to characterize antigen-specific cells. So the results of the vaccination. So uh, we do develop protocols that actually are based on the possibility to, to, to sort out antigen-specific cells 
um, so uh, it is possible to 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 evaluate these cells after uh, after sorting them and evaluate the uh, uh, gene expression profile uh, in these cells. This is what we recently did, actually in collaboration with the uh, University of Oxford, as well as with, with Mederi and the University of Milan, where we had the opportunity to evaluate. 4C men B induced vaccine immune responses. Again, this is the study design. You see, we, co we collected blood at different time points from perinatally HIV infect infected patients, actually enrolled here in Rome and in Milan. And at the time of vaccination, we had the opportunity to evaluate the B cell phenotype. As we show you, we had the opportunity to, to perform SBA, serum bacteria CD, saying. This was done by Vismederi at the University of Siena and, and also by University of Oxford and then by Andy Pollard and his group. And you see that actually first information that actually is confirmatory of our previous results that of course the HIV patients, they do actually respond diversely according to the time of, of, of art initiations. In other words, those patients that initiated the antiretroviral treatment early within the first year of life, they do have actually a better response. They do behave most similar to the, the, the health individuals. You see here, these are the early treated patients. These are actually the, 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 the healthy controls. And again, actually later the patients, they do have actually uh, and uh, somehow an ultra responses again, which is the reason of these ultra responses to for CMB vaccine? You see, actually here we had the opportunity to to sort out antigen specific cells. These are B cells that are F F HBP specific for, um, and you see here that the, the memory response is uh, actually in um, late mostly in late treated patients. Uh, are actually displayed in a typical B cell subset. And when you look actually at the genome profile of these patients, this is summarize our findings, you see that again, uh, HIV infected patients, in order to respond properly against false MMB vaccine, they need to downregulate actually inflammatory response, which is, which, let's say, which is, uh, let's say, basally, I will say, um, uh, more activated than than actually uh, uh, than healthy controls. So um, you see here that actually at baseline, before we perform the vaccination, perinatal HIV infected patients they do have an increased uh, frequency of a typical B cell subset. Um, if we perform actually um, serum bacteria, let's say. Of course, uh, 21 days after the, uh, the, um, the second dose, actually you see that actually the patients actually, they, they, they do have actually um, uh, a response in place, but they have a reduced ability to seroconvert. And again, actually once that we sort out antigen specific cells, uh, we observe a reduced frequency of antigen specific cell in the switched memory B cells compartment and an increase of these uh, uh, antigen specific cells in tissue like and activated memory B cells. Once that we look again at, at the at the specific transcriptomic profiles of this of this B cell subset, again the information is coming that, as I was telling you, in order to respond properly, perinatally acquire HIV infected patients they need to downregulate a number of genes such as NOT2, IL-4, or, 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 or BAF receptor, or BLIMP, so that are actually um, up, basically upregulated. And this is one clear information, again, that is coming, which goes in the direction that this patient, they do have a distinct memory response upon vaccination. So this is a clear information, and... Uh, mm, to us at least, but of course we really need to enlarge actually our findings and to validate our findings in much larger group of patients in order to reach our goal, which is the goal of a tailored vaccine intervention 
in our patients. Uh, another aspect that I just want to touch with you is the fact that when we talk about vaccination of special population is not just linked with the idea of the immunogenicity, but is also linked with the idea of uh, safety of vaccine in these uh, special populations. And uh, actually, one aspect that we tried to, 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 to face originally at the beginning was uh, really much linked with the safety of the new mRNA vaccine related to the uh, to the myocarditis, and this is actually the frequency of myocarditis uh, reported in U.S. Uh, in 2022 by age. Um, it is quite clear that uh, there is a higher incidence uh, linked with Moderna vaccine, probably due to the fact that, that uh, the vaccine actually uh, presents an higher concentration of the uh, mRNA compared to the Pfizer one, as well as there is a uh, quite clear evidence that uh, this phenomena is more actually present in males, uh, which uh, who are actually young adults. So uh, let's say between 16 and 19 years old. So um, this is actually a, a rare event, uh, but uh, still we need to understand the reason for that. Uh, and this is what uh, we were doing in our in our in our court of patients. We identified uh, 50 nowadays 70 patients that uh, according, uh, similarly to the literature, actually, they were median age, 15 years old, mostly males. Uh, mostly of the cases actually uh, of um, vaccine-induced myocarditis and pericarditis actually occur after the second doses. And uh, again, what, uh, what, what I want to share with you, the information that uh, we are following this patient in order to understand what is going on, and overall, it's critically important to the, the, the level uh, of troponin at the time, actually, of, uh, let's say, uh, at the first description, at the time of admission. In this case, actually, the patients actually came to our um, uh, attention seven, ten days after, actually, um, the, the symptom onset. And the level of troponin, uh, troponin uh, seems really to discriminate those patients that they do develop uh, uh, CMRI findings. So um, in all these patients, we perform CMRI at baseline and let's say after one year. And the scary information that this patient, of course, they still actually present uh, many of them, uh, let's say positive lesion after one year. We still do not really understand the reason and, and the meaning of that. But for sure, those patients with higher troponin level at, at, at on admission are those patients that are uh, all of them are they do actually have uh, present a positive serum uh, CMRI after uh, one year of follow-up. So as I was telling you, we don't really understand the reason of that. But uh, the point is that, which is critically important again to us actually, is the fact that uh, some of them, they do experience relapses. Uh, some of them, they were positive uh, actually for, for, for uh, CMRI. They did, they did experience relapse. And so again, we are interested in trying to understand the reason of that uh, and trying to enlarge our evidences. Uh, and we also had the opportunity to, to show that uh, this patient that do differs uh, from MISI patients that despite the fact that both this group, they do present cardiac involvement, the uh, vaccine-induced uh, myocarditis, uh, they do express high level of proteins strictly related to cardiac myocyte damage, as well as they don't, uh, we, we, we didn't identify any uh, uh, antibodies uh, vaccines. But more interesting, actually, we. Uh, we have some evidence that this phenomena can be linked also with level of antigens. Um, in these patients, actually, we did detect much higher level of antigen in comparison to the other groups. I don't want to go into the details of this, but of course, these were match for age match and for puberta stage. Uh, and, uh, and these uh, patients with cardiac events um, following immunization, they do display much higher level of uh, androgens in comparison to to MISI patients and to to patients affected by SARS-CoV-2 and healthy controls. So, in order to really understand the frequency of this of this phenomena, 
Again, what we are doing is to collaborate with this network that is a SEPI funded network recently um, developed, which is called INSIS, which I think actually I want to, to, to present here because again, I think it, it is a potential, I'll say point of a collaboration with, with Vaccelerate, where really actually a number of, uh, of um, let's say of institutions starting from the Brighton Collaborative Group, the Mayo Clinic, uh, the Canadian Group of Vaccinology, actually they, we are working collaboration to perform omics technologies, so omics study in, in samples of patients uh, who experience myocarditis, but not only myocarditis, also those patients that in, in experience thrombosis or uh, or neurological problems after mRNA vaccines. So the idea is by this type of approach is really to really to first of all try to understand uh, uh, the reason of these uh, actually um, vaccine induced adverse events, but at the same time also to get ready for new pandemics in order to have the network to describe and to uh, really. Uh, deeply understand uh, the, the safety profile of our vaccines and in the future also to identify those signatures that are linked with, uh, with uh, lower safety profiles uh, and go in the direction of so-called adverse songs. So uh, with the, again, with the final aim to uh, develop a tailored vaccine intervention for our patients. So to stratify the vaccination outcome before we perform the vaccination and also to reduce actually the risk of vaccination in our patient and maximizing the immunogenicity of our vaccines. Uh, for those of you that are interested actually in this topic of, uh, of um, vaccination of vulnerable patients, I just want to I like here the fact that uh, in collaboration again with uh, the the uh, the precise vaccine group uh, at Harvard University, uh, we launched the special issue vaccine that actually uh, will be there till next 15 of April, um, and uh, the the topic again is biomarkers of vaccine safety and efficacy in vulnerable populations. So for those of you who are interested, it would be great if you if you consider this for your future work publications. And I'm going to conclude by saying that, um, again, the population with special vaccination need is burgeoning and vaccine correlates of protection in this population are missing. The new essay based on system biology and vaccinomics paradigms can capture complex relationships among the new among these, uh, uh, let's say, immune components, immune compounds, and else response. And again, baseline and post vaccine data for vaccinomics can identify specific immune response profile, which may serve as signatures of or biomarkers to predict vaccination outcome in these patients. I will stop here with this, uh, with this, uh, let's say, final slide and this picture from from our last, uh, let's say, uh, um, meeting with the, with the lab team. And I uh, really thank you actually for the attention. Of course, I'm open to your question. Thank you very much, Paolo. I, actually, it was an excellent and very comprehensive presentation. Uh, and I think that you convinced all of us uh, uh, about the importance of uh, performing and assessing the immune profile of our patients if we really want to achieve a tailored uh, uh, vaccine strategy under the umbrella of uh, precision medicine, which is actually also the future of our evidence-based approach. Um, I would like to proceed uh, with one comment and one question, and of course, uh, for the audience, you are free to write also your question uh, inside the chat room. Uh, Paolo, uh, I think you mentioned a lot of important things. Uh, one of the points that uh, I would like to, let's say, propose, since uh, at, the, at your last slides you mentioned about the INSIS network, uh, personally, and we had actually the opportunity to discuss it a bit further during the Vaccelerate APT workshop, I think it's it would be a very nice opportunity actually to collaborate uh, with the existing Vaccelerate network, which consists 
and includes more than 500 institutions and clinical sites with the INSIS uh, uh, actually uh, network, both for the validation of uh, 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 what you discussed about the proposed, let's say, of biomarkers, but also to further as, uh, assess the correlates of protection, which is a major issue currently and a blooming issue uh, uh, with regards to COVID-19 vaccines and beyond. Um, uh, and in addition to that, I think also the established volunteer registry, which has currently more than 100,000 volunteers, would be another important, let's say, tool in order to further validate uh, validate all these important, let's say, uh, initial results uh, uh, that you presented to us. Just as a comment uh, from at least my point of view. Um, and, the co and the question would be, uh, from your expert opinion, how feasible do you think that it would be uh, to um, proceed with a large-scale manufacturing of these, let's say, lab tests in order to really, in our everyday practice, perform uh, uh, actually this kind of stratification that you mentioned, because not all transplantations are the same, for example. So what is your opinion on that? Well, uh, this is a good point. Thank you as well for this nice question. Uh, I think actually that uh, in principle is feasible. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that, because of course we're also collaborating as a pediatrician with, uh, let's say the idea of developing point of care testing in, in low income countries in order, for instance, to discriminate, uh, let's say, uh, patients with, uh, let's say, with um, higher risk to, to, to develop severe disease in comparison to the ones uh, that actually can be discharged. And uh, this is something that, for instance, in the context of Achillibris, uh, which is led by Kike Basse, um, they are doing. So they are, uh, developing point of care testing that provide this type of information. The critical aspect here is to really to create, a, um, let's say something starting from, let's say the complexity, reaching, uh, reach, reaching the key information that allow us to discriminate vaccination outcome in our patients. If we're able actually to uh, identify actually this key information nowadays is really possible in terms of uh, um, technology. technology available to, to develop such point of care testing, which are uh, relatively, I would say, also relatively cheap in order to, and can be used actually. Again, I just want to, to highlight this aspect because maybe uh, uh, you know this group from, from Spain, but uh, there are other a number of the other groups that are working in the area. I think there are nice, they, nice data that uh, have been produced by Diamonds as well, uh, showing the possibility that uh, is nowadays possible. For instance, according to few genomic uh, signatures, to discriminate between bacterial and viral infection. So um, once that we have the the information. Uh, and, and I will say the few information, this is the difficulty actually reaching this point. This is the reason why it's very much needed to, let's say, start from small evidence and then actually, uh, and, and the idea also of Accelerate to create a, an adaptive platform trial would be really valuable in this, in, the, in this optic. Also, the idea of starting from few evidence to, let's say, design, a study which allow us to validate our few findings and validate the ability of our, our signatures to, to cluster vaccination outcome. Uh, if we are able to do that and, and if we still start in Vaccelerate to include this type of approaches, I think this will be absolutely interesting and will make the difference in the future in order to, in order to really to, to let's say stratify vaccine approach according to to few informations, and this is something that can be done starting from let's say very simple information, which can be I don't know age, uh, lymphocyte count, uh, and so on, so. But then starting from that, actually, it is possible then to let's say enrich our machine learning approach with the omics data, and then try to understand which is uh, the so called the top load uh, proteins or genes or uh, let's say data that provide us 
this, uh, uh, let's say, critical information that we are searching for. Thank you very much, Paolo, for mentioning that. I, I think uh, it's a very critical point for the future strategies, uh, since we discussed also recently in the APT workshop about the importance to interconnect with the experts, not only the clinical trialists, but also the immunologists and uh, uh, the methodologists in order actually to structure exactly what you said and to be able to prioritize and validate uh, 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 these, uh, let's say, uh, refined tests. Um, I think this is a very critical point also for the future design of adaptive vaccine trials. And hopefully in the future, uh, we can manage to design um, such a way and approach of uh, our research questions. So yeah, and think a bit out of the box because generally speaking, we, we have the traditional way of including um, the most classical way to assess vaccine uh, efficacy or safety, but we forget that uh, especially from your side, from the immunological side, we have precious information that we can use uh, in order to uh, tailor our interventions. Um, we agree with you. Do we have any questions from the audience or any comment that you would like to ask to Professor Palma? I don't see anything in the chat, actually. Not me either, actually. Let me just check now because I'm open. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, actually, if not, uh, if we don't have any other comments or questions, uh, on behalf of the Vaccelerate Consortium, we would like once again to sincerely thank you for your great presentation uh, today. We really anticipate uh, our forthcoming and future collaboration with you and your team, um, and uh, we will definitely keep in touch. Um, Janina, if you wish to close uh, the webinar, thank you once again for my. Yes, thank you so much, Zoe. Yeah, thank you very much, Paolo, for taking your time and um, joining us in this webinar for this very interesting presentation. And thank you, Zoe, for your continued support with the moderation of the webinars. Um, I put the um, the form for uh, getting the, the ECMI point in the chat. If anyone wants to get this point, please fill it out and return it to us uh, within the next week. Um, if you have any more questions for Paolo, maybe you have to think about it first, then um, I'm sure you can send it to me by email. I will pass it on to Paolo and I'm sure he will help us to uh, answer it. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a good rest of the day and see you in the next webinar. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Again, and please actually have a look on this special issue in vaccine if you're interested in the topic. We will. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.